Can you hear that phone ringing? Yeah. Okay, let's wait a second. Slam dunk, are you ready to make me? Hola. Bonjour. Ni hao. Moi. Guten Tag. Nin hoi. <laughs> Privet. What? Ahalan. Konnichiwa. Whatever you say, my name is James Phelps. And I'm Oliver Phelps, and welcome to Normal Not Normal, uh, the podcast from James and myself. Hope you guys are doing really, really well today. Yes, and as you know, in this series, we're talking to some of our favourite people to find out what normal means. And really, does normal even exist? Today's guest is Nadia Hussein, who shot to fame back in 2015 when she won the Great British Bake Off. Now, the Bake Off, as it's known to uh, by a lot of people, is the biggest baking show in all of Britain. And it's gone absolutely massive across the seas as well. So if you haven't heard of it, definitely check it out. But in a premise, it's 12 people who are in a big tent, in a nice tent, and they go through challenges every week making two different bakes. I think it's two different bakes. And three. They, There's three. Three. So three different breaks. And they, yeah, they, they go through that. And then they have the showstopper, best baker. And then whoever is the worst that week gets voted off and then gradually gets down and down and down to the end of episode 10, where it's, someone is pronounced the winner. Um, so obviously, Nadia won it. Spoiler alert. But if you're getting spoiled by this, you're five, weeks, five years uh, too late. Anyway, anyway. She won it in 2015, and then literally overnight, she was catapulted to fame. And in that time, since then, she's become a best-selling author with a lot of really, really cool books, both for baking and also for children as well. She's got an MBE, which means Member of the British Empire, very, very prestigious award. So if you ever see um, people with their name and it's got some letters behind it, if it's not a doctor or something like that, MBE, CBE, OBE, they're all bestowed upon them from members of the royal household or you beyond that you get to like knighthood so sir or lady or dame should i say um and that type of thing goes on or lord that type of thing as well but also as well yes, can i ask are, are you I've, i know you know exactly what i'm going to say do you know all this because you're currently dressed like someone who was auditioning for prince charles in the crown no, I'm dressed like this. I'll be honest with you. So I was just wearing a polo shirt <laughs> and then I had to go outside a bit earlier. And we've actually had quite a strong frost here this morning. And I thought, oh, it looks cold outside. And nothing in this world is warmer than some cricket knit. So I had this cricket jumper or sweatshirt. And I thought I'm going to wear that. And I honestly, it is the warmest jumper you'll ever, ever wear. Um, Obviously, that's why I'm wearing it. And it just actually makes me, I know it's not folded over my shoulders and the, you know, all the rest of it. But then again, you look like you're about to deliver a, um, I don't know, a box of milk tray to those of a certain generation who will know what I'm talking about. Other people, you would say you just look like you want to try and rob a bank and deliver into that type of thing. So anyway, before I call the fashion police and let them know that you've escaped. That's rich. I'll tell you what, that's rich. Just saying, just saying. Anyway, what, um, on yourself, let's are you going to say, I'm here, come and get me? The cricket really, season no. is no longer on. It's still cold outside, <laughs> so I'm wearing it. Anyway, anyway, let's get back to speaking about Nadia. Now, as you can see, Oliver is quite hangry right now, but it's quite good. This is my segue in now. This is quite good because Nadia is essentially British royalty now. In anywhere you look, she's got an amazing recipe out and actually inspired me to get making uh, and get making, get baking over lockdown the, the last lockdown we did and i really really enjoyed it now nadia has probably gone on to be the most successful um <clears throat> what baker uh fresh yep. new baker in the uk easily in the last 10 years a very very easygoing speaking person and very very excited to speak to her i've been listening to her audio book <clears throat> sorry my throat's a bit sticky because i've been eating a few cookies uh, in preparation for this i have been baking as well from Nadia's recipes. From Nadia's recipes, yeah. What's really great as well is that Nadia's actually been really cool in making uh, public awareness more about anxiety, especially as something that she suffers from. And she did a really great documentary with the BBC about coming to terms with it, coming dealing with it, and re and then helping write books for children to understand what anxiety is and if they're going through 
something like that. They can relate to it and hopefully address it a bit earlier in their life. So very, very inspiring person as well. So I'm very, really looking forward to speaking to her. I was just thinking about talking more importantly, there's, there's certain things I think what she's obviously very, very aware of. And I'm really interested to see what her position is, if she's going to be the, I'd like to say, the straw that will break the camel's back on your argument about pineapple on a pizza. So on that, everybody, raise your cookies, raise your whatever that is. Ginger and almond snap. And please welcome Nadia Hussein. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. It's, oh gosh, yeah, I'm good. I think I always ask myself, like, it's really weird because whenever anyone asks me that, I feel like I should say I'm not okay, but I am. I'm actually, <laughs> I think I'm all right. I think I'm okay. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, very good. Um, So before you did uh, the Great British Bake Off, what did a normal regular day look like to you? So before I did Bake Off, I was a stay at home mum. And at the time I was actually just finishing off studying. So I had, I didn't go to university as a teenager. So I became pregnant with my little girl and it's my third child. And she, that's when I decided that I wanted a third child and a degree. And so a lot of, yeah, I know. Right. So like <laughs> I was revising, I, I remember revising, uh, she was um, overdue by a couple of days. And I remember just like on lots of painkillers, but revising for my exam that was due 10 days after she was born. I hadn't really thought about all of that. And I was like, I can do it, I can do it. And so I was, a normal day for me before Bake Off, long before Bake Off was um, just, I had, so by this point I had three kids under the age of four. So I was very busy and not sleeping that much. And so when I was, when I should have been sleeping, I was studying. So it was a lot of kind of, wake up, sort the kids out, nursery, back home. Um, and I'd spend like two days a week shopping for my elderly neighbors. So often that would be kind of making sure that they've got their shopping in and then um, back home with the kids, cooking, cleaning, just like very domestic stuff, um, which I have to say at the time I really enjoyed because it felt like my job at the time. It was like, that was my job was to be the best house. Well, I'm one of those people. If I'm going to do the laundry, it's going to be the best laundry you've ever seen in your whole life. Like it's going to be the best. So I kind of, that was my job. And so I, it was very much kind of home with the kids, cooking, cleaning, making sure they were sorted. Um, and, and my elderly neighbors, I spent a lot of time kind of in my gaps, um, having tea with them. So one smoked quite a lot. She did. And I was like, I'd, I'd, I'd have to like, really like, derobe after smell, being at her yeah. house yes so she was <laughs> like breeze the whole thing yeah. yeah 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 she was like do you want i'm like i don't smoke and she was like go on have one i'm like i have peer pressure come on i like 30 something i was like i don't <laughs> yeah. smoke i don't need to smoke not in if i haven't done it my whole life i don't need to do it now and then it was very much come home sort the kids out get them to bed and then study so it was very much kids home studying so when i should have been asleep i was usually studying um so really busy actually when i think about it yeah, yeah. yeah, and have you has that, has, that, has that always been like in your your makeup as it were like to busy yourself like as you say like having been expecting your third child and doing the degree, I couldn't think of anything more time consuming and also two polar opposites of like where your brain needs to be at. Is that just something what you've always been into doing that type of thing? Yeah, I think I've. I think I, I say that I'm quite productive. I think I, I like being busy. I just I, I'm not good at doing nothing I'm just not very good at it I like to constantly be doing things whether it's creating whether it's just sorting stuff out like I, I don't I'm not the kind of person you won't find me sat watching something even when I'm watching telly really the truth is I, I've got stuff happening in the back where I've got lists and what am I doing next and I, I'm not very good at relaxing so I'm quite like productive and 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 you know like productive is a word I suppose you could say you could use productive but also my husband just says it's like he says you have to stop like you will burn out because I just I naturally want to constantly be doing something all the time and and when I look back now to when I was studying and I and I had my kids and they were really young I don't know how I did it but I kind of we, isn't no. that normal though to look back in time and think how did I manage that like how how was that okay how why did I not rest and mm -hmm. I kind of look at my life now and it's actually really no different 
but I'm much better at telling myself to stop now. I think like I, sure. when, when my body says it wants to sleep, it's like just drop everything can wait. It can wait. So it, you know, I've dropped my st- standards a little bit. I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> Only a little bit. But just a I, bit. I really enjoyed uh, your book with finding my own voice. Um, I I actually cheated a little bit. I had you reading the audio one while I I did quite a few bike rides um, over lockdown just gone. And so I had one earphone in listening to that and it really did uh, pass the miles very easily. And it really made me laugh, especially the bit when you're describing about how people today don't know anything about pay as you go. You've only got 75p to text someone to make sure that, that means a lot. And that, right, that, that really did. Yeah. I was like, "My God, I haven't thought about that in so long." Is that? And then I started thinking, "Is that why so many people now, when they send a WhatsApp, they send loads of different messages just to get over the fact that you don't Maybe. need to, <laughs> that you don't need to get everything in." 140 characters or something like that maybe like my kids but my my boys have read the book yeah. and they don't understand it they don't get what i mean they don't get it at all and i was like you know what it doesn't <laughs> matter it wasn't your time there will come a day when your kids will laugh at how how um techno what a technophobe you are you know like they will yeah, they yeah. laugh at your kids will laugh at you just like you're laughing at me and they don't get it and actually you know what i quite like that they don't get it they don't need to get everything what i was surprised by though is that you didn't grow up baking and yeah. the, the the cupboard that was in the kitchen which just housed pans and things like that you learn can you can you tell us that story yeah so i so when growing up i i genuinely so i watched delia growing up like especially during christmas time and she like, and and i'd look at her and this is a, i'm a daughter of an immigrant you know we were a working class family and so like w- when i used to watch delia there was something quite um i don't know something about watching delia felt very uh like it completely out of this world like it was it was um aspirational i i think i look at it now and i think maybe it was aspirational but the truth is i think it was just a bit out of it was out of this world kind of abnormal for me mm-hmm. um in that she lived this like she, she you know it was the i look back now now that i make cookery shows i can see i now can see how it all happened because i know how it happens but like she's there in her beautiful kitchen with like you know, ovens in the wall. Like, I didn't even know what that was. Like, who has an oven in the wall? Um, and then, you know, a like beautiful garden, like really, really beautifully manicured garden. And there's Delia. And she's, it all looked like something out of this world for me. Like, it was out of this world, like, for someone like me. And we had an oven at home. And I didn't know it was the same thing that Delia had, just mine wasn't in the wall it was a freestanding with a grill on top if you remember yeah, yeah. those right yeah. so i was like that's just i didn't re- i didn't put two and two together and realize that they actually do the same thing because our oven wasn't actually functioning so our oven we, my mom never used her oven she always had all her frying pans like we um I, I, you know, we're asian so we do a lot of frying a lot of deep frying and she had one specific full of her oil for her samosas and she would fry all her samosas in there and she'd have all the other pans kind of stacked up in there greasy just in there and i just thought it was a cupboard i didn't know that you could switch it on like you know that knob that said oven like it had never been turned so it was stuck it was stuck with grease so there was <laughs> like you couldn't move it so i didn't know that it was an actual oven and it was only when i went to school and mrs marshall my home ec teacher at the time she was like and everything for us was stovetop so chopping onions all of that it was all very much on top of the stove cooking um and it wasn't nothing was ever mixed in a bowl that i remember as a kid and um she was there she was butter sugar eggs and flour and she was cooking uh, and to me she was cooking and i kept calling it cook i remember saying cooking and she was like it's baking i was like yeah okay and and to me all i could see was delia because that to me was baking i didn't see baking in any other way mm-hmm. and then she puts this and, and and she turns on what i call the cupboard and i thought she'd lost it i was like she's mad she's lost it like what is she doing and there it was like i remember nearly losing my eyebrows that day because i was so close and she like turns it on i was like that's hot i said mrs marshall that's hot why is that hot and she said that's the oven and so she puts this batter into a tin into the oven and and i remember just kind of standing there like this thinking I, I, what is she doing <laughs> it's a, it was my very first experience of those sounds of those smells of that ex- like i never experienced that in my life and what was and that is something for lots of children growing up in this country that's very much their normal you know watching yeah. granny watching granny mm. bake watching mum bake and being in the kitchen for me that was never my normal i saw her cook 
but never bake. And so out comes this cake and I'll never ever forget the magic, you know, of that moment of realizing that she just did what Delia did, but just not with an oven in the wall. Yep. Um, and you yeah. know what I did? I went home and I, I, I went really angry. I was really annoyed with my mom. I was like, did you know that that was an oven the whole time? And, she, <laughs> and she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. People make cake in there, but we don't make cake. I was like, so you knew this whole time that we could make cake in there. She's like, yeah, yeah, I knew. And I was like, and you didn't tell me? And she was like, no, because we don't bake cake. And I was like, said who we don't bake cake? So there I was, like 13-year-old, very angry me taking everything out. Most 13 year olds are angry about other things. I was angry about this oven, whacked everything out. And I was like, I'm turning this thing on. I was getting matches. The matches were out, the <laughs> matches were out. And I was like, I was trying to, turn, couldn't turn it on because it never worked. Um, so that for me was like a massive realization. Um, and that was really when my curiosity about baking started was when I was like, ah, oh. so this is something nobody does. So maybe I could do it. So mm. that's kind of where I became curious about baking. Yeah. Yeah. And is that, has that always been in your, in your thing? Like if someone says, um, cause I know in, in, in the book, you say like how not, not being spoken down to, but being told you, you don't do this, you, like university, you don't do that, you, you know, that type of thing, but there's always something implanted in you going, well, why not? And I should do that. I can do that. So with, with, with the baking thing, it was, I can do that. Yeah, I think I think I've naturally been very I'm naturally a curious person. And I think I'm I'm one of those people who like to learn all the time. Like I've I've just tried to I've just started knitting badly, can I say? Like um, I may get it right, but at the moment there's nothing wearable. It's just practicing. Um but I think I'm naturally I like learning, but I'm also naturally very curious. And that doesn't necessarily work growing up in the community that I did with the kind of values that we were raised with. Being curious doesn't work with that because you're quite often told that this is your normal this is what you do this is what women do this is your role you get kind of told that this is your place and one of the things that I laugh about in my book um I, which was like I can laugh about it now because I've kind of taken a hold of the situation is being called Begum which is my which is the name which is my second name but it, it means wife so essentially as a woman I my ultimate role was to be somebody's wife and I remember at 17 or 18 asking the question like what does that mean and mom's like oh wife because like that's what we're all like that's what women are they're wives I'm like what well, I was a wife at two days old five <laughs> yeah. days five really so that was something that was a, my, that was a bugbear for me as a bone of it, it was a definitely contentious kind of um issue for me growing up but I think you kind of we were raised with this kind of normal and then for me that normal never worked for me because I I was one of the I was the kid that questioned everything I was I was always really curious and I think when I was told when mom was like oh well, we don't bake I was like said who like who said we don't bake uh, um, and and I never really started I tried very hard to unstick that knob and try and get that gas hob that oven working I never could and it was only really I really I was allowed to express that curiosity in baking through um, being in the kitchen at school. And it was not really until, it wasn't until I got married and had my own kitchen, I realized like I had my own oven. Like mum couldn't shout at me about using the eggs or or taking too much flour or, you know, and, 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 and that was, I think that's when I could really feed my curiosity was when I was able to be in my own space, I suppose. Um, and I suppose that's why, because growing up, like, I wasn't allowed to go to university. I got in, but I wasn't allowed to go because like, I was the first girl, um, or first girl, first person in our family to make it out of college and get into university. And so for my parents, I mean, like, I look back now and as an 18 year old, I, I you know, as, as an 18 year old, I, I couldn't, I was so angry with my mom for not letting me go. But also like now in hindsight, as a 35 year old, I see as a, immigrant why that was a scary prospect for her because I may as well have been going to space for her I could have been yeah. you know blasted I could I may as well have been blasted into space because that's how alien going to university was for them so I understand now as a 35 year old that I'm going to struggle with the decisions my kids make because my normal isn't necessary my normal now is not going to be my kids normal so like no, that's no, so course. you know I think I there are going to be things I'm going to look at my kids are going to say can we do this I'm going to say yes but no and I'm not they're like yeah, there is going <laughs> to be tell a, me about it yeah I was like please just do it just don't tell me about it um but yeah so you know for me I think my curiosity is what led me to where I am today right it's got, which has got me thinking okay why is it that when hang on hang on hang on okay, one second so i've just i've just put sorry go on 
Hello, everybody. Thank you to our good friends at Yamaha for sponsoring this part of the show and sending me these amazing headphones. Now, Yamaha clearly saw my problem with Oliver and his rants. And hey, how do you not put up with rants? You put some good headphones on, right? So Yamaha have sent us these E700A headphones. And they're headphones which adapt to you and your environment. Now, they look very cool, as you can tell, but they're designed to produce sound that optimize and tune to whoever puts them on. They create a sound which is truer, not louder. So the sound is balanced even in low volumes. And the E700As are aware of competing external noises vis-a-vis -vis Oliver's rants. So you don't need to crank up the volume when you're in an environment which changes. It creates sounds that cuts the noise, not the music. So it has active noise cancelling technology, which carefully removes only the background noise without processing any of the music signal. So the music is left pure. If you want any more information, guys, please head to www.yamahamusiclondon.com slash E700A. That's yamahamusiclondon.com slash E700A. Now back to Oliver's rants and back to the show. Do you agree? Oh, yeah, yeah, completely, completely. So let's go. I mean, so in the, in the book that like you're talking about, um, you talk about when you entered a writing competition. So you've obviously been very creative in that, in all, in all aspects, really. Um, but also like how the previous winner of the competition got to go to Buckingham Palace. And then yeah. following you, you won it. But the invite to go to the palace wasn't there. But then obviously fast forward a couple of years later, and you're there, you're getting there, you know, becoming an MBE um, from the Queen's 90th birthday list and also baking the Queen's 90th birthday cake. Could you even imagine anything like that ever happening at that time? Do you know what? I think I would never have. It wasn't, it's really weird because as a seven-year-old, when that boy won the competition, I didn't realise what it, like, I didn't even know that there was a royal family at that age. I didn't know that there was a oh, queen. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So yeah. When, when they said she gets to meet the queen, that's when I was like, oh, there's a queen. And I remember then looking for a book about the queen and trying to find out who this queen was. And I was like, oh, that's got to be cool, right, to meet the queen. Because to me, the queens were only in fairy tales. They weren't real life. And, yeah. and I remember kind of putting two and two together. I remember reading about the queen. Um, in the days where you could go to a library and get a book and you couldn't just tap on the, uh, you couldn't just tap it and, and find the information. Um, so you're making never, us feel very old here. I know, I, 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 I don't, I don't feel youthful myself. I promise you things creak now. Like, I was like, oh, that was my knee. Um, but yeah, I, I would, I kind of remember thinking, I never really knew what the royal family was. And when he got to meet the queen, I thought that's got to be a big deal, right? If you get to actually meet a queen. I remember wanting to meet the queen never really and I don't remember I got a pack of pencils I got a pack of pencils and the disappointment you could not hide the disappointment on my face I remember taking the pack of pencils after winning the competition and looking in the envelope to see where the invite to see the queen was and, and it wasn't there so um yeah I suppose for me if I look back then and I look now like growing up in the house that I did my parents were not royalists you know they didn't like they, they were not, a, they didn't talk about the queen. They didn't talk about the royal family. None of that mattered because for them, it was, it was always survival. You know, I always grew up around survival about, it wasn't about bettering yourself. It was about just being able to pay the bills, just getting by. And so I suppose I never knew any different. It was just about always getting by. So I, I suppose in some ways I never dared to dream that big or that far. Um, it was always just about as long as I'm getting by, that's okay. And only recently, and I, I think, for myself, I, it's taken me a long time to step back and say, you know, you are allowed to dream. You are allowed to want. You don't have to always just get by. And that's a massive mindset for me yeah. to like, there's a big switch to be mm. able to do that because, you know, I want my kids to have that kind of balance where they have to understand the balance between like achieving, but also dreaming at the same time. And there's got to be a bit of that balance. Whereas like for me, I grew up just kind of like get by, get by, get by, pay bills, get on, but just don't, don't dream so big that it hurts when you can't do it. So yeah. um, I, now, like it's taken me a while. And I think maybe mostly during, um, like, I think mostly this year, it's been one of those things that I've kind of allowed myself to do. So yeah, I'd never have, like, I remember that moment when I opened it and found the pencils. I didn't, you know get that invitation to meet the queen I kind of it's not I mean it's not bad going is it like I baked a cake <laughs> MBE I was like okay so that's not bad but the, the reason why I kind of like it's one of those things that I can celebrate but equally it's quite humbling to grow up in a family where 
the royals mean nothing to them because I remember ringing my mum and saying I got an MBE. She said, "Yeah, okay. Uh, what have you cooked?" And so, like, <laughs> gone, 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 gone. Like, didn't mean a thing to her. And then I rang my dad and I said, "Dad, so I got an MBE." And he goes, "Oh, are there better letters than the MBE?" And I was like, "Dad, <laughs> like that." <laughs> what is wrong with you? And he's like, do you even know what an MBE is? He goes, I do, but I do know that there. He goes, I don't really know what an MBE is, but he goes, but I think there are better letters than than the MBE. And I was like, Dad, that's not fair. Like, let me just have this one moment. And then like that, I think that's humbling. Like I get to celebrate, but equally, it's quite nice that my parents don't let my feet come off the ground. It's like, no, yeah, no, 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 yeah. no. Keeps you grounded. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> Amazing. So I've got to ask, and so it was, was it, is it right that your husband signed you up for the Great British Bake Off? Yes. Yeah. And obviously because he tasted your amazing cooking and baking a lot anyway. So thank you very much to your <laughs> husband for that. Um, what was it like going through the, was there an audition process or was it like, did you have to send in a sample of what you can bake? It was, it's a quite a long process. So from start to finish, well, I didn't want to do it. So for me, that was really like, was, was that from my side? Possibly. Hear maybe James is. Maybe my dog. Oh, is it? Is it yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe. Sorry. I'm worried about my cat and I've shut my windows because my chickens are really loud. My chickens are so loud when they lay eggs. So I, I had to shut everything off. So hopefully you won't hear them laying eggs. Um, what was I saying? What were we talking about? My uh, husband, Bake well, Off, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I didn't want to do Bake Off. Like it wasn't, I'd watch it every year and he's good like that. He'll watch it with me and he didn't, like he doesn't particularly enjoy watching baking shows, but he's kind of forced to watch it with me. So he'd watch it with me. And he's the one who'd shout at the telly and say, oh, um, oh you can do that. Oh, you've done that. Oh, it, yours is better. Or you've, you know, there's things that would come up all the time. He's like, oh, you've done that. Or you've done it better. Or I've tasted that before. So. I didn't really think anything of it. And then, and, and there was a year when he just said, oh, so, and I was particularly suffering that year quite badly with my anxiety. So I was spending a lot more time in bed, really struggling to kind of be motivated. And just, I just, I was just very much, uh, I was at my lowest, I think, point then. And, and he just said, look, I've, uh, you can shout at me if you like, but I've applied for the bake off because but I can't send it off because there's some technical bits I don't really know how to answer so I've attached all the photos everything that they need I've done but if you could just do this bit and I said absolutely no way no not happening <laughs> it took him like like it was 20 minutes before the deadline and I said fine I'll do it but I'm literally doing it to humor you that's it if I don't get in and I get disappointed then that, that's on you and he's like yep yep fine <laughs> fine 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 do it so did it got a call back the next day and then it's quite a long process so it was a it was a two-hour interview so we did a phone call interview and then they ask you lots of things on the spot like how do you make an Italian meringue and and it talked me through a rough puff pastry so, so stuff like that oh, like, or like yeah. on the I'm like oh and I was on the school run and I was picking the kids up and then I, I kind of had some sweets in my pocket and that kept them quiet for about half an hour um and then so there was that and then after that, they ask you to drive down with your bakes to, so I went up to Manchester and then you take some of your signature bakes in. And then after you get through that process, then they ask you to come down to London and uh, do a Paul Hollywood recipe and a Mary Berry recipe. And then you take that down. And then if you get through to that stage, you get to the stage where you get to bake in a kitchen, do a technical challenge with cameras on you. So you get to do all of that. It's really weird when I think back, because that was quite a scary experience for somebody who suffers with anxiety. I don't really know how I did it. And then I made it, then I got the call and they said, you made it into the final 12. And I was like, oh yeah, great. No con you know, no shouting or whooping on the phone, nothing. Mm. I was like, mm hmm yeah, great. Okay, I put the phone down and I just, I called my husband and I said, guess what? And he said, what? I made it to the final 12. What am I supposed to do now? And, was like, <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh yeah, yeah, it's fine. He said, um, and, and, and then I rang the producer three times and hung up on her three times. And I said to him, I can't do it. Can you please tell them that I died? Um, and, and he said, no, but like, you know, you, 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 I can't do that. You're going to, if you want to tell him you died, you're going to have to do that yourself. I was like, yeah, but <laughs> it, doesn't I can't really work. Call, it doesn't work. I can't call them from the dead. Can you please tell them? And he said, nope, you've, you're in now. So you're going to have to do it. But like, 
firstly, who does that? Like who puts your very anxious wife on the biggest baking show in the country? And then, and then, you know what he said? He said that if you get on, just whatever you do, don't get kicked out week one because that'd be really embarrassing. Oh, I was like, no. what's wrong with you? I was like, there's something really wrong with you. You can't do this to me. And it's just like, it was a weird thing week on week. I just, my confidence just grew like little mm. by little and and that's something that I hadn't experienced in a really long time I suppose because since the point between becoming a mother and doing bake off I stopped challenging myself and that's what I think that's that's that was a massive realization for me because I allowed that point where I became a mum and bake off um and the kind of rigidity the kind of rigidity of my no, of my uh, of my routine became my normal and I was not willing to break out of that and I think that's the point where I allowed myself to break away from that normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I suppose as well, when you are filming, you get used to the the lights, the the pro the process of how they how they go about doing things. And I suppose in one way, did it make it easier that you weren't aware on the actual viewership of how many people actually watch Bake Off when you're in the in the in the kitchen itself baking yourself? You've only got like the crew around you. So yeah. does that almost make it a bit easier in one way as well? There is a naivety to doing a show like that there really is because mm. you do and and like it, there is because once you're in that moment and you, the, you guys definitely will know what that feels like you know when it becomes your world when it just becomes your normal and becomes your world you almost forget that there's going to be a process where things are edited and put together and there you are there's your face there it is yeah. all a part of this story all a part of this show and it's like that that that, that I, I as somebody who'd never done that before like I was really naive to the fact that I was doing the biggest baking show in England and I'd, I'd completely forgotten and and I remember um once we'd filmed the final and I never intended to go all the way like I didn't think that I, I was like no week one two at most like even that was me like pushing myself I was like mm. and 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 even then like I remember getting to week 10 and I call it week 10 and my husband even to this day I say week 10 and he said you know that's the final I'm like stop saying final <laughs> and he goes yeah but there is no week 11 so you know what that means and I was like stop saying it so there is a naivety to doing something like that because you do you do kind of almost forget but I suppose when you kind of when you allow yourself to forget that millions of people are going to watch it you actually enjoy it more and I think that's why yeah. by forgetting that millions of people are going to watch it I allowed myself to just enjoy the experience um as hard as it was and and then the kind of cameras in your face asking you questions at crucial moments when things should be coming out of the oven mm -hmm. becomes normal <laughs> yeah I mean I don't know I don't know how you keep your cool in that situation when you're kind of like or is it is it a case of yeah okay okay <laughs> yeah well I so I so I think I I think I got good I think I got practice in that I I was used to having three kids around all true, the time true yeah so you yeah, know when true. you when you when you have three kids you kind of get used to stopping and having to ask ask question answer questions or stopping to get one of them a glass of water and it just felt I kind of said every time I was like. When they were around, I was like, they're just my children. They're just my children. They're just, that's what I did. I used to say to myself, just my kids, just my kids. They're just asking me questions. It's fine. And that got me through it weirdly because it felt a little bit away. It felt like being at home, but not at home because they just interrupted me in the crucial moments, just like my kids interrupted me at crucial moments. And that's like, I just, it just felt easy, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then in terms of like when you finished, obviously you finished filming and there's, there is a long break in between finished filming to when it's actually aired first of all how did you manage to keep it a secret from everybody as to that you'd actually won it? and also stop all your family telling everybody yeah. as well um apart from your mum and dad I kind of get the impression they'd be like yeah you know they got that um yeah and then was it <laughs> and then was it a case of like when that did happen obviously everything in your life in terms of rec being recognized on the street everything else kind of just in a whirlwind changes well I you get like a six week so from the point it's harder for the people like I suppose in some ways because I only had six weeks it was only six weeks because I made it to the end I only had six weeks where I had to stay quiet so it was really weird because I also had the trophy to then hide mm, yeah uh, we happened to be in the process of selling our house as well so I was like ah so where do I hide this thing so I did this Russian roulette a Russian doll thing where I hid the I wrapped it up and hid it in a suitcase, in a suitcase, in a suitcase, and just I like, didn't even think about it. Um, and I didn't actually tell my parents till uh, week nine. 
Um, and they don't watch Bake Off. So I just said, so there's this baking show and I kind of made it to week nine and they're like, okay. I said, would you like to come? They're like, yeah, 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 we'll come. And so they didn't really know, like they'd watched yeah. it in bits, but they didn't really know where they were going or what it was about. Um, and, and like, I mean, you've probably got a measure of what my mom's like um, and, I, and my dad. And I remember walking out on the final day and with my cake and my mom looked over at mine and then she said, looked over at Tamal's and she said, Yes, yours looks very pretty, but his looks so much better. I think he's going to win. I was like, thanks, mum. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, mother. I mean, there's feet on the ground and there's like yeah. crushing your soul. Was, um, yeah, and her, yeah, 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 yeah. She's good at that. Um, but yeah, there's that moment where you have to keep really quiet. And I have to say, my dad was really good at keeping quiet, which is hard for him because he, like the moment I'd won, he would walk around and say, have you watched Bake Off? You, did you watch Bake Off this year? So he was like announcing it to anyone who hadn't ever watched Bake Off. But it was, I thought it would be really difficult. But weirdly, like my boys who were seven and six at the time were, um, they were really good. They just kept really quiet, didn't say anything. But they make them sign little agreements like NDAs and like it's really wow. cute but weird at the same time. But all of them yeah. sign these, like, everybody has, there's like 200 people at this garden party. How they keep yeah, them, yeah. like I'm sure there's Bake Off Mafia, you know, like that keep everyone quiet. Like, <laughs> yeah, how, on the door, yeah. <laughs> yeah, how do they keep 200 people quiet? Um, and I remember um, my little girl was there who just turned four and, and she was there. And I remember when we were watching Bake Off, like week two, she was getting really into it and she was like, oh, mom, who do you think is going to go now? And like, I, I get that she didn't know who was going to go out week on week because I'd never spoken to her. But when we got to the end, it dawned on me, week 10, the final, she said to me, mom, who do you think is going to win? Do you think Tamal is going to win? I was like, hold on, she was there. How has she forgotten? <laughs> and I, I, was, I, was a I was a little bit annoyed. I was like, excuse me, young lady, you <laughs> saw me win. How have you forgotten that? And then she, I remember her holding onto my leg saying, oh gosh, mom, I think Tamal is going to win. Yep, Tamal's going to win. Yep, Tamal's going to win. And she genuinely thought Tamal was going to win. And then she said, oh, you won. And then she was, and then there's that moment where she goes, you won. And she goes, oh, I was there. And so it's so <laughs> cute. So luckily, she was like, she was definitely the weakest link. So she was the only one that was ever going to tell, and she never did, because she forgot. So. Mm, yeah. Mm. And, your, yeah. and your acceptance speech, by the way, was something which I'm, the, I'm literally just watching Great British Bake Off my wife's really into it. I'm like, this is interesting. And then all of a sudden I find myself like a, a wreck on the sofa. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's so good. <laughs> I think it could, it's very um, relatable how, and up, up to that extent, I don't think anyone, the, the wider public knew what you were going through during that whole process um, with your anxiety and things like mm. that. So, and it wasn't until later on you did that fantastic show on the BBC about about it as well. Can you talk about that that process as well? Yeah, I think uh, it was one of those moments when you well, it was when you, when you're doing a show like that, like you have somebody who it, you get the same person interview you every time. You know, once you've done a bake, you come out of the tent and you talk about the bake and how it went and all of that. You get like for me, I was really lucky because I had the same person the whole time. So we really got to know each other because off camera, on camera, we were chatting and mm. um, the, the good old days when you could like hug and, 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 and have physical contact. It was lovely. So we would, we, we would sit and we'd chat about it on camera, off camera. So we kind of built a, a, a rapport, a relationship. And it was really lovely actually, because in that moment, all we did was when I won, all I did was cry and all she did was cry. So we just kind of stood in front of each other with this camera between us and just cried. And and those words that came out, it, it, they were like 20 minutes later, they were still trying to get me to say something and it just wouldn't come out. And those were the words that, that's what came out in that moment. And that was it. And and um, and I, I remember looking at her, th I can remember her television eyes thinking, wow, that's not gonna need editing at all. I remember looking at her face and she was like, <laughs> that's like, that was so, so she, anyway, so we, 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 we did, I remember saying that and, um, it was one of those, I remember kind of like after Bake Off when I met loads of people and they just said, you know, that those words really resonated with me. And I hadn't, I suppose for me, when I look back now, I really struggled to watch that back because I remember in that moment realizing that actually this was much more than baking for me and mm -hmm. where my journey started and the reasons why I did it. It wasn't, I often get asked like, was there a plan? Did you have a career plan? Was there something that you dreamt of doing after Bake Off? I had no plan. Even to this day, I don't have a plan. I just, I am mostly winging it through life, but I quite like where winging it has taken me. And 
you know, I didn't have a plan. There was no, I, there was no career in mind. There was no plan. There was no need to do this to kind of move somewhere in, you know, like m- move myself. You know, there's no plan five year, 10, there was no forecast. Mm. And so um, I know there's loads of people who watch that back and say that really resonated with me because it, it was, it was more, much more than baking. Anyone who suffers with anxiety or any mental health issues will know every step was difficult for me. And, and in that moment, it was much more, much, much more than cake. And of course, it's, it allowed me to really then talk about my own kind of issues and my struggles with my mental health. Um, but yeah, it was much more than cake for me. And I, I, I kind of see that. I definitely, I, I felt that throughout, but I definitely, right at the end, uh, when when I realized that you know like I like I I can, I, I you know like I, that when you realize you're kind of you have that power inside you to do whatever you want and I suppose for me for such a long time that was suppressed you know through the way I was raised the community I grew up in and the things that I was told I allowed myself to believe that that was all I that that, that was all I ever had that was all I was ever destined to mm-hmm. become and I think in that yeah. moment I realized that I am much more than just what everybody else said I was going to be. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I've got to, I can kind of, in a, in a, a way I can relate in terms of like obviously dealing with things going in your head um, is a lot different to what's being put out there um, on social media, on like how your life's portrayed on TV and stuff like that. How do you, like, what is it what's happening inside your head when you say to yourself, okay, as you say, you've done that and then transferring that forward to like, how would you advise people who are dealing with anxiety and have got things to, you know, they've got, as you said, like their own almost, I suppose where I was, I was in my own personal view, I always say like you're wearing a mask. So you've got like your mask for public life and then you take that off and that's what's going on inside. But, you know, things don't need to be shared everywhere. But how do you, I don't, I don't I'm not trying to get like a story out of you, but like what's the, what would you say is advice to people going with, who, who are listening now, struggling with like anxiety of some sort, but how they would best to, to channel that, how to best work around it? Um, I think, I realize now years later that often I spent a lot of time fighting it. Like I spent a lot and I have a way of describing. So I think first, one of the things that really helped me was actually giving it a name, like actually giving it a label and image. And so often it was such an obscure thing that I couldn't, I couldn't really describe it or explain it to anyone. And to kind of look back at my kind of eight, nine year old me who suffered with anxiety and ask, you know, ask, I ask my, my, myself now, so what would you, how would you want to, like, as a kid, how would you have described your anxiety? And often giving it a face or giving it a name, usually that's what helped, that really helped me to come to terms with what I was dealing with because it became tangible by giving it a name and giving it a face. And I, I've, I've kind of since then always called it my monster. And there are months, there are moments where, um, that monster is so big that it's like in my face and it won't let me get out of bed and it won't let me function. And there are moments where that monster is is kind of manageable, where it's kind of behind me and kind of taps me on my shoulder occasionally and just lets me know it's there. But I'm managing, but I'm getting through my day. And there are times when my monster is so teeny tiny, it just sits in my pocket and I can just walk around, get about my day, go about my day. And it, and it hasn't affected me in the slightest, but I know it's there. So I suppose mm. I spent a lot of years just like by doing that, that really helped me to really understand it. And it really helped me to explain to my children because one of the things that I found that I, as somebody who suffers with mental health issues was, it's a lot of hiding. It's that mask, you kind of, yeah. you you hide it. Uh, and much like being in, you know, being in the public eye, there's this kind of image of you on television, glossy and shiny and colorful. And there's the other image where, you know, you can't get out of bed because you're struggling to, because um, you, you're struggling with your anxiety. So it's that mask. It's like you constantly have this kind of mask on. And I think what I found was that I was I was the best liar to my, like I lied to my children all the time. I created this, I wasn't allowed, I didn't allow myself to be vulnerable to my children. Mm. And, um, and I think um, the kids had this image of this woman who could do everything. She was, like she didn't ask for help. She did everything. She just got on with it and everything was always done. Everything was always done. And I was there with a smile on my face, waiting for them to go to bed so I could fall apart. And actually the most um, liberating thing for me was being honest to my children. And and so I didn't, I don't lie anymore. Like when I'm having a bad day, I say, I'm just not having a very good day today. I'm struggling today. And, and they understand, now they understand anxiety the way I explain it, which is, with a monster so like now sometimes they say you know like I feel like 
sometimes my son will say like I feel like the monster's really taking over today so or he'll say the monster's happily just sat in my pocket it's absolutely fine so giving it something tangible has really allowed me to kind of do my job because obviously doing such a public facing job means that the the issues that I face are very different to the ones that I faced five years ago um yeah as a stay-at-home yeah. mum so the, the but it doesn't take but the way I handle it is exactly the same. So, um, and I, so the problems don't feel bigger anymore. So the problems don't feel bigger or greater or less manageable. They're just the same problems that I had, but different. And so I find that being honest, not only to my children, but just being honest in the public, you know, when I'm talking publicly about my mental health, just there's such a shame attached to mental health uh, illness that like by talking about it, it takes away the shame. Mm -hmm. And of course, growing up in a community where um, there is no actual vocabulary for mental health illness. It's really hard to explain to people like my parents or certain people within like, and I think it's an age thing. I think it's an age thing as well. I think it's certain generations, yeah. Yeah. certain generations, yeah, not, necess not necessarily always communities. I think certain generations don't necessarily understand mental health. So I'm trying to kind of dispel some of the myths and, um, and, and, and talk about them within my community as well as with young children. And that really helps me. So for anyone who is struggling or is suffering, I think find somebody to talk to. I think that's really important. Find somebody to talk to who will understand. And often I find it really helpful to talk to somebody who doesn't understand because you really get to kind of talk about it in a way. And it's really weird. It's really therapeutic to talk to somebody who doesn't get mental health or doesn't understand it because you almost come to a conclusion and understanding yourself by talking to them. Yeah, 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 definitely. And you can see that um, when you talk about the monster, your monster, you've done a few books for uh, children and young people to to learn about this, which has been really good. And then obviously you've done cookbooks for children and adults, but the adults can use the children ones and the children can do the adult books, which are yeah. really good. Um, I've actually been using yours quite often recently. Yay! So <laughs> let me try and get these. So I've did the cookies first time I've done cookies? Yes, which are they unreal, look good. absolutely unreal. <laughs> yes, and then the the best one I've I've done, which I'm showing off because Oliver always likes to cook and I'll, I'll bake and I'm he always, yeah, he's, show, he's showing off now. He's showing and, off. Uh, now. So I so I recently did the hot cross buns. Oh, did you? Which and I love hot cross buns, but I was I was watching your TV show on the BBC and I was. You know, when Homer Simpson gets really hungry and he's like, oh, yeah. oh, oh. <laughs> I was literally like, when you're doing that, I was like, I need to make those. So I ended up doing those and it was absolutely fantastic. So, I was, and I'm, I'm not really a typical baker, but I found it so easy. And thank you for making it so idiot proof that I could do it as well. So, oh, see, I don't like, hot, see, I don't like hot cross buns. I hate oh, hot cross mate. buns. So I made my version that I like. So I'm yeah. so glad you did them. No, they were so, well, no, I can't have normal hot cross buns now. <laughs> so That's it. Now you've got to now you've got to have jam filled berry hot cross buns. Exactly, but it was uh, <laughs> it was very good. So that one's out in the UK. That's right, and then in the US, your time to eat is out. Yes. And is that on? So did you have to convert all the measurements into American? Yes. Like, oh, style gosh. quartz and all that. <laughs> like? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So they had to be then, like we had to just change it around, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't too difficult. It was, it was good fun though, because it's my first cookbook to ever go out in the US. And it's really exciting, but it's really sad because I don't get to travel with it. Because often when a book comes out in a new country, yeah. I get to do oh. the traveling with it and meet lots of people. And I really, you know, I've not been able to travel with them, so, uh, with the book, but it's great because the series was actually out um uh, on netflix and i always yeah. get that flurry it's and, and social media is a double-edged sword it's great but it's it can be difficult sometimes but in those moments when you get people share like the recipes and tell you that they love the series or the, i love all of that it's so exciting because like there's nothing better than um being able apart from actually writing the books and publishing the books and writing the recipes when people actually make them so thank you james for making them no it's <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna just harass you now on uh, Instagram. So look what I'm gonna keep. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. No problem. <laughs> but when, so when, when you are like making a making the cookbooks, um, Nadia, how do you do? You like have a team? What helps you? Is like, say, so, hey, maybe we need these on this one, or maybe on that one, or are you literally like, right, okay, I think I know how to make this one. Then it's just like creating, or a bit like when, um, like, say, you're making some uh, recipes from, say, like what what, what your mum used to make, and yeah. that's all off memory how does that how is that how long is that process 
I am a one woman band. Literally, there is no, I mean, if I wanted to, of course, I could have somebody testing with me or creating with me. But I'm like, when I say they're my recipes, like I spend months and months and months. And and like my kitchen is my kitchen that I work from. My kitchen is the kitchen my kids spend most of their time eating, doing homework. So it's a small space, but it's something that, you know, like between the children and my recipe testing, that's literally where I do everything. Um, and I, I do, I have to say, I do spill out into the garage a little bit occasionally just because there's so much stuff sometimes but um from start to finish I test every single almost 120 recipes over three months so wow. I'll yeah so over three months and it's not a bad it's not a bad life I've got to okay. say no, like, sure. yes, plan all along I think so yes <laughs> yeah. I, yes yes I think he always just wants to have cake because it is like he has cake for breakfast and and um we are that family like I'll wake up and I'll be like boiling squid or octopus or something like that in in the in and the kid is just normal now like for them I could be just like I'm like guys I'm just making gelatin and so I'm like boiling bones in a pan and they just like to them the smells the sounds are all very normal but the process is quite long so and I am on my own and I could very easily have help if I wanted to but I just choose not to because I feel like the essence of the book really has to come from me that because mm -hmm. Ultimately, yeah. like when I'm sat here talking about the recipes in the book, like the fact that I've written them and tested them in my kitchen means something to me because when you make them and when other people make them, like that's really special for me. And I, I never want to lose that essence. And I've, you know, every single book gets written at home. I test every single recipe for three months and then I send them over and then they get tested by somebody else just to make sure that they definitely work. And then they get sent back to the pub, they sent back to me. Then I make sure I add any extra notes that I need to. Then they get sent back to them. And then it's just a lot of back and forth. And then we do the photography. Um, and then, you know, usually after that, we'll do the cookery show and then it gets hopefully published after. But that's a process from start to finish nine to 12 months so oh, yeah yeah, it's, yeah. It's but, but, but i think i think i think that it definitely comes across though in the writing and in the as you say like you you've been able to talk about it now but even just when you're reading the books you can actually tell that it's been it's not had like a massive team of people and like they're using you as the face of it it's very much like your your creative output yeah i mean like chicken donuts that's <laughs> that definitely <laughs> that definitely came from a dark and that's wonderful good, place in my I, head because you like adding things to things which some people would deem shouldn't be there an ongoing thing during this series because i seem to have really upset a lot of italy pineapple on a pizza yes or no no for me oh, Sorry. Oh, see, oh, james, james you're losing there. this you're losing this whole argument there. just just drop it now just drop no. it I'm not, I've got to say, like, well, if if there is ever pineapple on a pizza, I'll eat the pineapple and then eat the pizza. And then not at the same time. Yeah, they don't no, get to do, the you, time. You're, pineapple and pizza, really? I, I had he's, pineapple pizza with, with tangerines it. on it the other week. I wasn't going to pick oh. my favourite twin, but I think I just have. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, moving on. It's, James is shopping. Because we're, shopping. we're, um, we're, we're I'm uh, conscious of time, Nadia. But, um, so what is a normal day to you now, then? Um, a normal day for me now is usually, um, wake up. So I was like very much, I think before I was very much focused on like waking up and it was all about, like for me, a normal day for me now is waking up really early, well before the kids, like long before the kids, because I need to wake up before them in, not because I need to be there and awake for them to see me, but I need to be, um, caffeinated and awake before them otherwise I wake up in a frenzy otherwise I can't do the whole wake up with them so I always kind of I like the mindfulness of waking up before the sun so I my goal usually every morning is to wake up before the sun and just kind of watch the light come in and it's really mindful for me because I get up I'll get up wake up make myself a coffee come back upstairs and I'll get dressed and kind of for me it's about so I pray every morning and I get up and I'll pray and and as the sun comes up the kids will start to wake up gently and that for me is like that's how I always start my day just always it has, like I find it really difficult when my day doesn't start that way because it just um I feel slightly um out of sorts if, mm -hmm. if it doesn't mm. start that way and then like it's usually wake up sort the kids out and and it's feed all the animals so we have a lot of animals. We've got four chickens. We have a rabbit. Uh, we have a cat. 
we have uh, a budgie and we did uh, adopt a tortoise. So uh, yeah, so we have a lot of animals. So it's usually like my kids wanted to learn responsibility. So I said, we've got to, like, if you want responsibility, then you've got to learn to look after something before yourself. Yeah, so yeah. so we wake up and make sure all the animals are fed and have had their breakfast. And then the kids wake up, they go off to school and I spend between sort of, then I wake up and then I go for a run. As soon as I've dropped my last one off to school, I go for a quick run, come back. Um, and this is, for me, this is my new normal because like before it was all about everybody else but me. So now I do things that make me happy as well as allow me to have a functioning home at the same yeah. time, but as long as yeah. I'm happy. So uh, I go for a run and that always makes, it sets me up for the day, come back, get sorted, get onto some work. And that could involve talking to you guys, doing podcasts, doing interviews um, and uh, or traveling into town or often it's testing recipes. So apron on and from start to finish, like sort of 10 o'clock to about half two, I will um, keep going. I always go to half two, finish testing. And usually the kids come home to uh, a, like array of sweet, savory snacks, you name it. There's like 12, 15 things sometimes. So I don't ever <laughs> cook dinner. And then like I have a wheelbarrow. So I put food in a wheelbarrow and I walk around to my neighbors and say, is there anything here that you want? There could be cake. It could be fish. It could be anything. Like, it's like wow. is there anything here that you would like? And, and it's cool because I try and go before they cook their dinner so that they don't have to cook dinner. And yeah. so, and then I stick stuff in the freezer and then I'll go at half two, I'll go out for another run and then I'll come back and then pick the kids up. And then that's me done for the day. That's it. And then just then we settle into the evening, feed the kids and just just relax. That sounds oh, amazing. Wow. And that I really sounds, want to see like one of your really, really... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to be I'm going to I've got I've got to go and talk to my neighbor a bit later. I'm going to ask why, why. How can you never do much cooking anymore? Yeah. Exactly. Um... Where's your where's your wheelbarrow? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think I lent him one to do the garden with. But... <laughs> <laughs> probably need to get a new one yeah um but also as well Danny, so we're talking about um just briefly we're talking about your your other books but you obviously got your time to eat which is now out in in america so as you say it's your first international or um american published thing can you tell us more about that yeah so time to eat is um so it was published last year and it was one of the books that like, it's really important to write a book like this for me because um it was about being busy and this is not just about kind of people with children, anyone who's kind of short of time, which most of us are, let's face it, like we have quite busy lives, kind of, it's always go, go, go. And I think one of the things that really suffers is our cooking and eating. And I think if you really think strategically and really kind of use what you've got in your house to save time, you can really eat well and eat well and save time and spend time with the people that you love and make time for yourself to do other things. And it's kind of just the way I cook. And that's why I wrote the book because I very much use my freezer. I batch cook quite a lot. Um, I And I don't throw away. I'm not like, I hate wasting. Wasting really upsets me, like really upsets me. So it's got lots of little tips and tricks on how to not waste things. Simple things like say, for instance, you've got some, you, you, have you ever been in the fridge and then your herbs are all wilted wilted mm -hmm. and weird and soft yeah, right yeah, yeah. all yeah. you need to do is literally stick the uh, the wilted herbs on a plate and put it in the microwave for 10 seconds and they dry and dehydrate and all you do is kind of do this with the herbs pick them up and then they become like dry herbs that you would buy in a jar oh. from the supermarket so little oh. things like that and i think just allowing people in to my head a little bit and saying this is like utilize what you've got don't waste and 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 you'll save time and things like and you'll save money like all of those things are really important and i think these days i think we've got we grow up we've we're growing up in a society where it's instant gratification like you literally can get whatever you want whenever you want click of a button and i think we need to kind of step back sometimes and say hey you know like you don't we don't have to live like that we can slow down and if we just think about it we can save time we can save money but most of all we can enjoy eating and being around the people that we love. And that's what that book was essentially all about. I mean, there's a, there's a recipe in there, which my kids absolutely love and only discovered only when I wrote the book that it was scrap soup, which is basically all your potato peelings, all your carrot peelings, all of your bits and bobs that you would normally chuck in the food waste that they are, um, we use those and put them into a freezer bag over the month. And then you end up making something like four kilos of vegetable, delicious, wholesome vegetable soup. Right. So 
it's things like that. So it was really important to write a book like that because that's how I cook and that's how I eat. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for that. I'm, I'm <laughs> definitely going to be a, uh, because peel's the first thing I throw away. So I'll, that's something I'll definitely oh, you've be looking got, into. You've, you've got scrap soup. You've got a scrap you, soup. You, yeah, it's really okay, good. I'll give it. I'll give it a try. So okay. I've got these things called the 3 a.m. questions where essentially the the, answer, the right answer comes at 3 a.m. Uh, when you can't sleep. But anyway, so quick fire, but what is your favorite food? Oh, gosh, my favorite food. <laughs> Anything deep fried. <laughs> uh, your favorite book? Oh, uh, The Lovely Bones by Alice Siebold. Nice. Your favorite song? Uh, my favorite song. Oh, um, Counting Crows, Accidentally in Love. Nice. Uh, your favorite film? <laughs> oh, Gladiator. Gladiator. Or Fight Club. Or Brilliant. Fight Club. I love Fight Brilliant. Club. Brilliant. I actually used to know there was a guy who used to walk his dog near where I walked my dog, and his dog's name was Maximus Decimus Meridius. But he would literally call him. <laughs> the full name. The full, the full name. name, yeah. Exactly. I love that. It's, <laughs> it's almost pretty... as good. My rabbit's name's Cornelius. Nice. I just... Nice. nice. And, sorry, and your favorite quote? Oh, my favorite cup. I can't. Well, it's it's one of mine. Sorry, I don't know yeah, if you can fine. even no, call no, no, it no, that. That works. That works. I can and I will. I can and I will. Perfect. Now, thank you so much for joining us this week. I've really, really enjoyed that. Thank you yeah, so definitely. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, I've really enjoyed that one. Really good fun. I'm 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 a bit of a Nadia um, fan anyway, so that was very very good fun. But in Obviously, when we when we found out that she was going to come on, I decided to do a bit more baking than I normally do. In fact, ever. So, like I said, you, I was going to say you don't you never do baking. You, if anything, you say to me, "Oh, you're doing more baking today, are you?" Yes, exactly. But I, I found a way to justify. I think the reason I wasn't baking before was because I didn't want to eat all the naughty stuff because um, I was very conscious on healthy living. But I decided if I'm going to be doing a lot of exercise, I need to put fuel in the fire. And that's how, that I, how you judge it. That's how I justified it. Yeah. So yesterday I did a 10K and then I so said, then I made these cookies. Right. Okay. Okay. Very good. No, no, as I say, but um, yeah, first of all, thank you so much again to Nadia for joining us as well. Um, I couldn't get over how much of a hectic schedule she has in the day. I was feeling exhausted just listening to what she does before half two in the in the <laughs> afternoon. Definitely. Oh, sorry. The dog's off, the dog's off again. Um, dog's off again. He'll calm down. I agree. I agree. I agree completely. Well. I think so. Mm. But I, what was also great, I thought, was how she's just very easy to talk to, isn't she? You could literally just go and have a cup of coffee with her wherever, and it feels like you've known her forever. So it was very, very ex interesting to talk to her. Very uh, glad for her to come on. And I say that her her um, memoir autobiography, uh, Finding My Own Voice, is a fantastic listen, a fantastic read. All of her cookbooks are very easy to go by. That's a lot like myself. I'm I'm not very good at reading recipes, but they're very simple to follow. And also her her books for kids to help them understand what anxieties and things like that about uh, the monster. Very very well done as well. And again, it's just um, something which I don't think has been done before as for someone who everyone can relate to. Yeah, and especially like easy tools as well. What she what she was saying, how she deals how she deals with it, and obviously she's got a very supportive family behind her as well, and like almost like give her that extra drive to do so. Um, but no, and no, I thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm definitely going to go back into the kitchen this afternoon to uh, to do a bit more baking as are well. You, are you going to well, do not, something maybe, other than what you normally do? What do you mean? Well, with you, it's what did you bake today? Oh, I did shortbread biscuits. Oh, I done. I, I, I've done I did key lime pie. I did. I did. Well, the thing I did key lime pie day before yesterday. Uh, before that, I did Victoria sponge. Before that, standard. I did a traditional Valencia paella. So paella. Yeah. I did pa quite a paella. bit, James. Paella. But it depends what you put in it. In Birmingham, we say paella. Uh, right. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, yeah. So I tried that with the traditional uh, Valencia style, minus the the wood to cook it with that was just on the hob okay yes yes but anyway back to our chat with Nadia yeah as I say it was just really really enjoyable so hopefully everybody listening really thoroughly enjoyed it as well learned lots of new things and has got their taste buds going thinking right I need to go be creative I'm going to do some cooking right now well as we would say 
everyone in America, uh, Time to Eat is now out. And everyone in the UK, Nadia Bakes is out now, as well as all the other stuff. And if you're not in one of those two countries, just look online at any of your very reputable bookstores and type in Nadia Hussein. So please check it out. Like I say, very, very interesting, very, very funny. And especially going back to the back in the day when mobile phones were becoming more readily available and it was pay as you go. And it was, what, 25 pence to send a text message? It was a joke. It was a joke, right? But I also remember... Yes, right. So I remember actually with the whole thing, yeah, 25p for a text message. But then if you sent three messages, all the rest of the messages that day are like 5p or something like that. Then also, if you remember rightly, if you use your WAP, so now I'm sounding really old. So WAP was internet on your mobile phone before you had like smartphones and everything like that. Lord help me if you went to look up a recipe on there because that would just drain any credit you've got on there originally. Then you've got to go back to the supermarket or the off-license or the post office or whatever to buy a ta- – right? You used to have to buy a, a almost like a little card. Do you still do? Scratch off. Do you still have to do, do you, that? Have you still, I don't know. I don't know. But like you'd have to scratch off this little strip in the middle to give you a PIN number. You'd then call this number on your telephone and then write in – or oh, then, then type in the number and it would tell you, yes, you've added 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 quid credit to your phone. It was an, it was a, if you think back, it was an absolute farce because in terms of actually storing, like paying with a credit card or anything like that, that hasn't really evolved in the last 15, 20 years since we used to do that type of thing. Mental. mental. Well, there you go. I bet you always appreciate now when they say you get unlimited calls and limited texts. Mm. I suppose so, but it's just, ah. Oh. It used to drive me absolutely mad because then sometimes as well, you text a number in or something like that. You text a number for like a competition or I used to have it on like score updates from the football. And they charge you like 20 p a message as well. Lord help you if there was a high scoring game. (laughs) Okay. Well, that on that. Anyway. I know this. This this shows Oliver that you have lost the plot. You're you're ranting about something which no longer is a problem or an issue. So you need to get right. help. But in that sense, I'm going to round this on to my. Did you know? Ready? Okay. Okay. Go on. So did you know the first text message was sent on the third of December in 1992, and it simply yep. said, "Merry Christmas." Who sent this message? Was this was- Neil Papworth? Right. Uh, One year later, in 1993, Nokia introduced an SMS feature with the distinctive... Uh, You got a text message? You mean... Beep, 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 beep. That's the one. Beep, 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 beep. And and then the the ringtone, the famous Nokia... Oh, God, this is sad. Anyway, moving on. How was that? How was that ringtone from the old 3210? (laughs) <laughs> and then you get to trigger happy TV. Someone would always do it. Exactly. Hello! Right. Mike, let me anyway, go to... If you're uh, listening I've got to this two... podcast and you were born after the year 1998, you have no idea what we're talking about right now. We're not. So anyway, my, ne- my next did you know. Did you know a tarantula can survive for two and a half years without food? Really? So if you ever saw a tarantula and it looks hungry... Probably best to run. That's how it is. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Another thing about a a, um, smaller species, which has an amazing fact. Did you know that a snail can sleep for three years? They sleep. So how long do they live for? I don't know. You're sleeping for three years, you're winning. Yeah, exactly, (laughs) exactly. I wouldn't have thought they live much longer than that either. And a hummingbird, you know, a cute little hummingbird, that flaps its wings. Did you know that it can flap its wings up to 90 times a second? Well, I can I can believe that. Which actually. is 5,400 times a minute. Wow. So there you go. How's that for this week's Did You Knows? So next time you see stupid. a tarantula, say, are you hungry? Next time you see a snail saying, you're feeling tired? And if you see a yeah. hummingbird, say... Hello, hummingbird. What are you up to? And he goes. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, good. So, well, thank you very much for that today, James, uh, with your lovely did you knows. But more importantly, thank you to Nadia Hussein for joining us today and telling us all about her backstory and also obviously the exciting stuff what she's got on the uh, the works for available for now for people to check out. Definitely. Thank you very much, Nadia. Thank you very much for introducing these amazing cookies into my life. Uh, I'm going to be dialing into those as soon as we're done. Guys, thank you very much for joining us this week on Normal Not Normal, as proven. Normal probably doesn't really exist, and if it did, it definitely is not in the form of Oliver. Thank you very much for joining us this week. I've been James Phelps. And I have been Oliver Phelps. Take care, guys. Bye.